Welcome to Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Sue, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about one of my favorite surgeries, which is called a cervical laminoplasty, which is a really good option for patients that have cervical myelopathy. And cervical myelopathy are really the symptoms that happen when people have severe spinal cord compression in the neck. Just like all the other surgeries for myelopathy, the primary goal of this surgery is to take pressure off the spinal cord. The laminoplasty is a posteriorly based surgery, so it's done from the back of the neck. So we basically make an incision in the back of the neck and we expose what's called the lamina. So there's the back of the neck. This is the lamina back here. And plasty means to make larger, like an angioplasty um, for a heart attack, they take a balloon, go in, they expand the blood vessel. Um, it's basically a plasty to make larger. The nice thing about a laminoplasty is it's not a fusion procedure, so you really maintain almost 90% of the range of motion in your neck. So it's a great procedure for people that already have, have really good motion in their neck. So again, for a laminoplasty, we'll go to the back and basically make a cut here all the way through the bone. And on the other side of the lamina, we make a cut, but only through part of the bone, and we call it a green stick fracture, so each individual segment can actually hinge open. That allows the spinal cord to flow back, but essentially what's happened is we've made a partial cut on that side, full cut on that side, and as a result, we can hinge it open like that. So that's like a little trap door at that segment. And we can do that at every segment. So you can see these two segments are kind of trap door open like that. So there's one trap door, there's the next trap door. So as a result of the trap door, there's a lot more space for the spinal cord in the middle. Now it used to be that the trap door needed to be held open, otherwise it would close back down the spinal cord and we used to use sutures and then we started getting all these little miniature plates to be able to actually hold the trap door open. So these are called laminoplasty plates. So this is what a laminoplasty plate looks like. So it's a very small plate where this part gets braced up against one piece of bone and this part sits on the other and kind of props it open. So with our model, it kind of looks like that. So you can see that plate is holding that hinge open and Here's a nice kind of acrylic model of it. So there you can see we made a cut on this side, a cut on the other, and then each segment was opened. And there you see the laminoplasty plate kind of holding each segment open. And you can see how there's an expansion of the canal with this plate holding it open. The nice thing about the plate is that you've opened up each separate segment but you've allowed independent motion between the segments. So again, it's not really a fusion, you're just expanding each level. And we have these little screws here that go on and they're like these little screws, almost the size of like a screw for an eyeglass. You'll see how tiny this little laminoplasty screw is. And that screw goes into the bone and basically secures it to the bone and props that open. And here's kind of a, a schematic to show um, uh, what the plate looks like as it's holding open. And sometimes we stent it open with bone grafts, sometimes not, but ultimately it's just to keep in each individual segment propped open so that the spinal cord is underneath it. And it really is meant in order to maintain and kind of normalize all this anatomy. So the theory is what happens long-term is that this hinge that's been made previously, because we cut through part of the bone and hinge it open, that kind of heals up and fuses. So once the hinge side fuses, it kind of stays propped open, even in a plasty and enlarge the entire canal without really fusing each segment. Um, the laminoplasty technique was developed in Japan and there's lots of different nuances with the laminoplasty, which is why I like it so much. Sometimes it's combined with what's called a laminectomy up high to allow the patient to extend and flex forward. You'll have to talk to your surgeons about those nuances. Here's a 50 year old patient of mine, pretty normal looking neck. You can see the spinal cord is compressed. You can see we elevated each segment and on the x-ray here. You can see how each segment is elevated separately, but on flexion extension, you can see that there's still kind of motion in the neck because we've preserved each level. And here's another patient um, who, who actually didn't have the greatest posture in the neck, 
but based on different measurements, we kind of concluded a laminoplasty would be a good thing for him. You can see before his spinal cord is very compressed. Here's an MRI after. You can see how free the spinal cord is. There's fluid around the spinal cord now, and this is his x-ray looking at freedom uh, around the cord. Um, a cervical laminoplasty takes about an hour and a half to two hours to perform. Most patients are in the hospital one day, maybe two. Um, there is a little bit less pain with a laminoplasty than a laminectomy fusion where we have to do a little bit more dissection. The laminoplasty is limited to kind of very small midline dissection. Um, there is significant pain usually for the first kind of week to two. We control that with narcotics. I have patients wear a cervical collar just for the soft tissues to heal for up to two weeks. This is what a soft cervical collar looks like. So patients wear this for up to two weeks. After two weeks, they can take the collar off. Um, and basically patients are allowed to move their neck um, because this is again, not a fusion procedure. You want that neck to move and maintain flexibility. Um, usually that hinge side that has to heal um, can take up to three to six months to heal. So we still want patients to be relatively careful. I start physical therapy at around eight to 12 weeks for these patients. Um, what are the benefits of surgery versus the risk? Well, the benefit is decompression of the spinal cord. As we said before, when patients have myelopathy, the purpose of surgery is to prevent further cord injury and to stabilize the condition. The reality is and if we get to it early enough and patients are younger age, sometimes we do get some improvement in myelopathy, but the purpose is to stabilize the condition. And that's the real benefit is that your spinal cord is safe. The risks of surgery intraoperatively, um, the Spinal cord is covered by a very thin layer of uh, dura um, because the spinal cord lives in a fluid. That dura is about a thin as saran wrap. If there's bone spurring as, they kind of, as we do the hinge, sometimes a, a, the spur can be stuck and the dura can tear. If the dura tears, it's not a big deal. Spinal fluid leaks out. We have to sew it shut, glue it, sit you upright for a day or two. The laser recovery, but a dural tear does not change the ultimate outcome of surgery. Incident dural tear is probably around 3%. Um, we have to put these little plates in the right positions. This is a very kind of tedious surgery as you can imagine. So sometimes the hinges break, sometimes the plates have to, you know, be kind of judged around to look perfect. Um, if the hardware is causing a problem after surgery, we have to come back to revise it. Um, I can think of 14 years, I had one or two patients where we had to go, go back to revise um, one of the plates or the hinges. Um, it's usually not an issue. Uh, post operative chance of infection, less than 1%. Um, and one of the biggest risks is something called a C5 palsy, which can also happen with a laminectomy infusion. So what happens is the spinal cord is very compressed and the spinal cord is in the middle of the canal. There's a yellow thing and the nerves kind of come off. When the, when the plasty is done and you elevate the lamina, the, the cord floats back. When the cord floats back, these nerves get tugged on and those nerves go down the arm. The C5 nerve is the shortest nerve. The C5 nerve goes to the shoulder and it gives you uh, shoulder strength, deltoid strength. Sometimes up to three to even 12% of patients when that cord floats back, it can tug on the C5 nerve. There are different strategies we can take to try to prevent that, but it can happen. It's a real complication. If it happens, patients get weakness on the deltoid and it can be very disconcerting because you have to eat and you have to move your arm up with your deltoid. Usually it gets better uh, almost always in the first six to 12 weeks. Sometimes it can take up to a year. Uh, but it almost always does get better. There really isn't much to do for it other than make sure that you use your other arm and you do what's called active range of motion to prevent a frozen shoulder. So that's kind of one of the more significant risks of a laminoplasty. Otherwise, a laminoplasty is actually an awesome surgery um, for treatment of cord compression. It's probably my go-to surgery. Um, and it's one of many options, including the ones from the front, the fusion, the disc replacement, the lami fusion from the back, but laminoplasty definitely has its place. For many years, we thought that those patients that had a cervical laminoplasty did the same as those patients that had a cervical laminectomy infusion, which is the alternative. For that reason, surgeons were either trained to perform either a cervical laminoplasty or cervical fusion. A great study came out in 2021 in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, looking at the outcomes comparing cervical laminoplasty to cervical laminectomy infusion. This is a multi-center study across North America. 24 surgeons participated. And the study found that those patients that had a laminoplasty did better in terms of less complications and better clinical outcomes than those patients that had a cervical fusion. For that reason, I'm almost always gravitating towards a cervical laminoplasty rather than the fusion if there's an option to do both. Now, not every patient's a candidate for a cervical laminoplasty. You'd have to talk to your surgeon to see if you're a candidate for one. 
one of the most interesting things to come about the study, in my mind, is that of the 24 surgeons in the study, only one third were actually trained or knew how to do a laminoplasty. The other two thirds only knew how to do cervical laminectomy infusions. So of course, if a patient's presented to a surgeon that only knows how to perform a laminectomy and infusion, they're always gonna perform a laminectomy infusion. Of the surgeons who knew how to perform both a laminoplasty and its alternative, which is a laminectomy infusion, the majority of the time, those surgeons were always gravitating towards performing a laminoplasty in that study. That's also been my experience, which is I have to have a good reason to perform a fusion, otherwise I'm always performing a laminoplasty. If you've been told that you need a cervical laminectomy infusion, my advice would be find a surgeon that knows how to perform both a laminoplasty and a laminectomy infusion just to see if you're a candidate for the laminoplasty. It's my hope now that more and more younger surgeons are trained to perform the laminoplasty procedure as time goes on because I think it's a great procedure. Um, here's one of my patients, um, uh, Richard. Richard had significant cord compression. We decompressed his neck. He has a little bit of a pitch forward posture, but he wanted something a little bit less invasive, so we def definitely decided to go for the laminoplasty. Um, and this is how he's doing now. So the range of motion on my, my right side is almost uh, normal. It's uh, very unrestricted and feels pretty good. On the left side, it's a little tighter, but it's much, much better than it was prior to the surgery. And then what about looking down and up? Looking down, I can look down now it's with pretty good. very mild discomfort, but I can look totally down. And looking up is the biggest thing. I couldn't even yep. come close half of that. That's great. Before. So Richard had severe, critically severe spinal cord compression. We did a laminoplasty. Uh, he's about four months out now, and he's ready to go golfing in two months. Yep. Give us a thumbs up, buddy. You got it, pal. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the subscribe and like button below and leave comments in the comment box below.